online at our website or via Venmo. We have PayPal. There's also a box on the connection table. We are going to start worshiping the Lord now through song. So join us. Clap your hands. Sing up loud. Dance along if you wish. And we are going to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. Alright. Let's sing the other today. Jealousy I'm hearing It burns through me like a 
1500 in the first century, and um, archaeological excavations have revealed two ancient synagogues, one built on top of the other, which fits nicely into the story of that, that we have about there being this lavish synagogue built by one of the Roman centurions. Uh, but that's Capernaum. In contrast, the pagan cities of Tyre and Sidon were cities in Lebanon. They're still cities that exist today. They were part of Babylon, and God actually decried them as evil, wicked cities in Ezekiel 26 through 28. If you read those three chapters, he's like, Tyre, I'm going to destroy you because you're wicked and evil. Sidon, I'm going to destroy you because you're wicked and evil. They had banded together to destroy Israel. And now Jesus makes this bold claim that if I had done the same miracles in those wicked cities, they would have accepted me as king. But I did them in these good Jewish cities, and they didn't accept me. But if I had gone to these wicked cities, they would have accepted me. And Matthew wants us to wrestle with this question. Am I like tourism, Capernaum, and Bethsaida? These are good Jewish cities who were religious and faithful, and yet somehow they missed Jesus? Or am I willing to repent? Am I willing to look at the evidence of Jesus as king and bow my knee to him? And just as if Jesus hadn't ruffled, uh, ruffled enough feathers, he's like, oh, by the way, Sodom and Gomorrah, they'd still be upstanding cities to this day had I shown up with them. But they would have repented more than you did if I had shown up to them. Sodom is the most wicked city in the Old Testament. It's a city that tried to um, sexually assault and murder the messages, the messengers of God, if you go back and read about it. And Jesus said, yeah, if I had shown up in that city, they would have repented more than you did when I showed up and did my miracles in your city. Ouch. That's a slam. Like, Jesus isn't holding anything back here. Tyre, Sidon. Sidon and Sodom were usually the bad guys in a rabbi's teaching. Like if a rabbi stood up and talked, they were easy people to point out and say, these are the bad guys. It would be like if I stood up and I said, cowboys suck. You know, and it was, yeah, you know, it's easy in this setting to pick on those guys. But Jesus was saying they would have repented if they were given the same opportunities you had been given and you didn't repent. Jesus said, divine judgment for Sodom is not going to be anywhere as strong as divine judgment on the religious people of Capernaum, the people who prayed every day and kept the law and recited scripture. They were going to face a harsher judgment than Sodom because they refused to submit to Jesus. Jesus showed up and they were like, nah, I don't want any of that. You can do a lot of religious activity and totally miss Jesus. You can memorize all the right theological answers and totally miss Jesus. And that's a sobering thought. You can vote for moral things and preach and teach and join churches and sing songs about God and miss Jesus. And so I think the question that Matthew wants us to linger with, and I think we need to linger with, is am I missing Jesus? But remember, all the right answers, we've done all the right religious things, and that's about miss Jesus. And Jesus says the city of Capernaum. Is it going to rise up to heaven? It's going to go down to Hades. Out. This is Jesus in Capernaum, trashing the town he frequents most often, the town he lives in, the town he spends most of his time working out of. He's totally trash talking them. It would be like if I stood up and I was like, "This suck," you know, and people start throwing bricks at me. That's what Jesus is doing. He's standing up in Capernaum and he says, "Your town is going to burn in Hades." Now, that's not a good way to make friends in Hades. Now, we can't mention Hades without all of us feeling a little cringy. Anybody feel a little cringy? It's like, why? Why do we got to talk about Hades? Like, can't we just leave this uncomfortable thing aside? Um, every few months, I'll receive a message, and it'll be somebody online who will send, excuse me, an email or a message on social media, and they'll be like, you don't talk about hell enough. Like, I don't know why people are so obsessed with hell, but it's true, I don't talk about hell a lot. And that's not because I'm just like, oh, it makes me uncomfortable though it's not a favorite subject of mine, it's because the Bible doesn't talk about it. It's mentioned in a few places, but most of the time they're much more interested in Jesus and what Jesus did and is going to do and what Jesus in you does in your life. And if you go and look at the apostles, when they talk about Jesus, they're not like, heaven or hell, which one's it going to be? They instead say, Jesus lived and died, he rose again and ascended to heaven, now what are you going to do about it? He's the coming king, what are you going to do about it? And if you look through the New Testament, that's how they preach about Jesus. They don't mention hell a whole lot. And so I don't mention hell a whole lot. 
But occasionally we come across a passage like this, and I have a responsibility to talk about it. So let's talk about it. Some of your translations, if you look up Matthew chapter 11, will say Capernaum will go down to hell. I read out of an NIV this morning, which says Capernaum will go down to Hades. Uh, so which is it? Why the difference? Let's talk a few minutes about how the New Testament authors use the word hell and how it's been translated. There are five words or phrases that sometimes get translated as hell in the English. The Latin Vulgate, which was like they took the New Testament and translated it into Latin in the Dark Ages. Originally, just translated all five of these words and phrases as hell. They were like, it's just all hell. Even though it's five different words. It would be like if I said, hey, I want to go to McDonald's for lunch, and the next day I want to go to Wendy's, in which I don't want to go to any of these. These are terrible. Animals. They're just both like. But the third day I want to go to Taco Bell, and you'd be like, oh, he all want, the only place he wants to go is Papa John's. And you'd be like, he didn't use any of them word, you know, the three different words. But anyways, the Latin Vulgate was like, let's make it easy. Translate all 117 references in scripture uh, that are these five different ways. Let's translate them all as that. And that's what they did. Over the last several hundred years, most scholars have differentiated between these different words. And they're like, hey, they use five different words for a reason. We're talking about five different things. So what's the five words that in the Latin Vulgate all got translated as hell? Number one is sheol. This is a Hebrew word found in the Old Testament. It's used to describe the grave as the final resting place of the good and the evil. Sometimes it seems to be used in a very poetic sense. Sometimes it seems to be in a literal sense of there's a place when you die and you go. You're not just gone. You go to this place. You go to sheol. Jonah 2.2 2 says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of sheol I cried and you heard my the second word that's used that's sometimes translated hell is in the New Testament. It's a Greek word, Tartarus. In Greek mythology, this was the underworld prison where the Titans were kept. The Titans who had fought against the Greek gods and were banished down to this pit. The Bible describes some demons as being chained in a pit or hell, as it's sometimes translated. The word is literally Tartarus. And here's uh, the only time it's used in the New Testament. Testament, 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, that's how it's translated in the NIV, the word is Tartarus, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. The third way, or the third word that's sometimes translated hell is Hades. This seems to be the Greek equivalent of Sheol. In the Greek mindset, everyone went to Hades, the good and the evil, watch the movie Hercules, right? Um, the Disney movie Hercules, uh, which with my daughter, we've been watching back through all these Disney movies I remember as a kid. And you're like, wow, oh, this is way darker than I remember it being. This is way scarier than I remember it being. I don't remember any of this. Anyways, Matthew 16, 18 says, and I tell you, you are Peter, this is Jesus talking, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell. The word there, NIV chose to translate it hell in this case. It's still the word Hades, that it translated Hades in the passage we just read, shall not prevail against it. And you're like, oh man, so now I'm all confused. Sometimes they choose to leave the word as Hades, sometimes they choose to translate it as hell, which is, I remember I was watching as a kid one of my favorite shows, Animaniacs. Anybody old enough to watch Animaniacs? No, okay. It was a crazy, bonkers show, but I loved it as a kid. They were insane. They just did the most insane stuff. They were essentially these cartoons that lived at the Warner Brothers studio, and they just destroyed everybody's lives, and no one could control them. Um, anyways, I loved it. So when my parents walked in on me watching it one time, and they were like, you just bought a one-way trip to Hades! And they pulled a lever, and they sent this contestant down into the earth, and my mom, being the good Southern Christian that she was, immediately turned off the television and forbid me from watching it anymore. And I said, what's wrong? They sent him to Hades. Like, what's the big deal? And she's like, Hades is hell. Um, and in her understanding, that's what she thought. But actually, Hades is, in the Greek mindset, just the graves. It's like where everybody goes. When you die, you go into the grave. You go into the underworld. You're not here anymore, but you're not gone. Your spirit, some part of you lingers on 
you're not gone, but your body is. That's not a place of necessarily torment, but it's not hell. Gehenna. Now, this is the word that probably is most, this is the fifth word, or the fourth word. Um, Gehenna is a word that's most probably should be translated hell. Jesus implores this word when he wants to talk about divine judgment. When the, the, the word itself, Gehenna, means the valley of Enon. It's a real place in Jerusalem. You can go there today. Um, Jeremiah says that evil Israelites sacrificed their children to Molech, this foreign god, in Jeremiah 732, in the valley of Canaan. And then in Jeremiah 19, it says, God knows the innocent children who were killed in the valley of Canaan, and he will bring justice on those who burn their children alive. And so, first century rabbis began to use the imagery of Gehenna with the fires of these pagan sacrifices as a picture of God's righteous anger and justified punishment of evil. And so, if you look at other first century rabbinical teachings, they're using this image of Gehenna in much the same way Jesus asked, as divine punishment, some type of divine punishment. Matthew 10, 28 is a great example. This is what Jesus says, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one, who in context is God, his Father, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The word is the hell. The last phrase, lake of fire, is only found in the book of Revelation. It's the final resting place of the Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so we have these five different words used in scripture. Latin Vulgate just says they're all hell. And then we have other influences in the Dark Age. Dante's Inferno. A lot of what Westerners think about hell comes from Dante's Inferno or from Plato um, and his ideas about the eternal soul and things. Um, so a lot of times we are coming to these passages with all this baggage from our history, all this baggage from things that we've heard, and then we have these translation things where translators sometimes translate hell, and sometimes Hades, sometimes Vienna, sometimes hell, sometimes Sheol, sometimes hell, sometimes Lake of Fire, sometimes Tartarus, sometimes hell, and you're like, okay, what am I supposed to do with all this? In Christianity, there are three main approaches to the topic of hell. Each are considered orthodox and have a long tradition in church history dating back to the early church fathers and mothers. And so Christians don't always agree about hell. And so if you're like me, you're like, I'm a little squeamish about this. I don't like this. Why are we talking about hell? Let's talk about something happy and pleasant. Let's get on from this. Can we move on? Um, there's disagreement about it. And so if you're watching online or you're here and you're like, man, hell is the one thing that keeps me from following Jesus, there's this reason. Um, here's the three main approaches that are all considered orthodox about hell. One, this is probably the one you're most familiar with in the West. Eternal conscious torment. People in hell will suffer for eternity without any hope of escape. That's one view. Another is annihilation. People in hell will ultimately be destroyed forever, dismantled with the kingdom of darkness that Jesus' kingdom is rushing in to demolish. That some people say, I don't want to serve King Jesus. I would rather cease to exist, just be burned out of existence, rather than bow the knee to King Jesus. The third view is purification. Some people believe that in hell people will suffer, but it will ultimately lead to a point of repentance and faith. Each of these has spiritual evidence for each of these positions. There are scholars on each side of the debate. Uh, there are good Bible scholars who are like, we love the Bible, we love Jesus. We're not some crazy, like, you know, just dismiss everything in Christianity. There are good, smart people who get different opinions on this. If the topic of hell is tripping you up, recognize that no Christian loves this topic. If you ever meet a Christian who loves the topic of hell, who's just like, hell's my favorite. I want to talk about hell all the time. I'm not going to be your friend. You scared me a little bit. I mean, for every Christian I met, hell is not a subject we like. But there are options to remain faithful to the Bible and Jesus and think differently than mainline evangelical Protestant positions of eternal conscious torment that has dominated American Christianity. 
If you can't get past that, there have been a lot of Christians over 2,000 years who have taken different positions on this, and they're all considered orthodox and spiritual. Especially if you get outside of America, you'll find a lot of people around the world, a lot of Christians, who have taken different positions on this. They all agree that to be absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. They all agree that there is some type of divine judgment that evil people who hate God and hate their fellow humans, who take advantage of the weakest, most innocent people on earth, don't just get off the hook. That there's some type of justice that comes from God. But there's a lot of disagreement about the other. So, I would love if there was a place in the Bible where we could flip over to it. And it says, as soon as you stop breathing, here's what happens. You feel this gas. And all of a sudden, you're whisked up into the air. This beautiful color is all around you. There's clouds. Poof, you come out of the clouds. Jesus is standing there, and he's like, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome to your reward. And then you walk in, and it just describes everything. We don't get that. We get that. We can trust Jesus in this life, and we can trust Jesus in the next life. I would love it to be able to be like, hey, you're an evil, wicked person, you breathe your last, and all of a sudden you're sucked down in the earth, and you see, we don't get that. We get a little bit of images about darkness and about fire. We get images um, about regret and pain and shame, but it's not all spelled out for us. What we have, though, we have enough to be able to do it. Okay, everybody okay? Nobody threw anything at me and nobody ran out screaming. We're okay. If you have questions about hell afterwards, we can talk about it. Um, despite our hang-ups around the word Hades or hell, that isn't Matthew's focus in this passage at all. He just mentions it and it goes right on because to him that wasn't a big deal. To us in the in the uh, in modern times as educated Westerners, we get hung up on that, but he doesn't. Here's what Matt, Matthew is focused on. Here's what how NT Wright puts it. Jesus knows, despite all the remarkable things he's done there, that the Jewish people in front of him were bent on going their own way, following their own vision of what God's kingdom was like. And he knew where their vision would lead. Their vision of the kingdom was all about revolution. It was about swords and spears and surprise attacks. People hurt and people killed. Violence to defeat violence. A holy war against unholy warriors. Loving your neighbor, but hating your enemy. Stabbing your enemy in the back when he slaps your face. Or stabbing your enemy in the back when he asks you to carry his back around. That's the sort of kingdom vision they have. And in Jesus' mind, it would be better to be in Sodom and Gomorrah and have fire and brimstone raining down than it would be for them to fight God's battles with the devil's weapons. I thought N.T. Wright put that so well. How often do we try to fight God's battles with the devil's weapons? How often do we justify the means in order to accomplish the end we want? Would Jesus look at American Christians who use politics and bullying and power and money and shame, and would he shake his head and say, Woe to you, America. You think you're going to rise up to heaven, but you'll be brought down to Hades. You'll be brought down to the grave. It would be better for Sodom in the day of judgment. I don't know. Sometimes I, I look at the news headlines, and I'm like, just don't call yourself a Christian if you're going to do that. If you're going to hold that bullhorn out there and say that, don't call yourself a Christian. Call yourself anything else. Would Jesus say, you have known me and you know my scriptures, and yet you have not lived and loved like me. You have lived so differently than I do. Matthew wants us to wrestle with this question. What excuses do I make to avoid living as Jesus did? Because I've got all this religious stuff to do. So I don't need to love my name. And I'm doing all these good things. I have all of my theology right, so I don't have to do that. Are we bent on going our own way? Are we following our own vision of God's kingdom? As we pray and close today, I want to just, all of us, to take a moment and ask, do I need to repent of something? Repent just means make a U-turn, head in a new direction. Is there something in your life where you say, I need to change direction on this, because if I keep going down this path, but keep heading this way, eventually it's going to lead to destruction. And right now I have a chance to change direction, to head in a new way, to make a new turn, to not go where this is leading me. Maybe you need to repent and say, hey, I need to become a follower of Jesus. Man, I do a lot of religious things. Man, I believe a lot of good things. But I will never become a follower of Jesus. Maybe that's the day to repent. Maybe there's something in your life where you're like, I just kind of let it go for a while. But if this continues, it's going to lead to a place that I don't want to go. Let's just 
take a few minutes. Go quiet. And just think about, is there somewhere where I need to change direction in my life? Where I need to make a new turn? What excuses am I making to keep from living and loving
This week, may King Jesus bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lovingly look upon you and give you peace. Number 624 through 26. You are dismissed.